First of all, Dr. Copeland, thank you so much for trekking across town to um, do this interview because I know you, the, the hotel probably where you're staying is nowhere near here. So no, it was, no it was like anywhere else. You, oh, okay. Point A to point B is not a problem. It's, Particularly that's with the government closed down. I know. There's no traffic. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> kind of sad to say, but that's the case. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's start out with where were you born and, and raised and how did that affect um, me? Yes. <laughs> <How> did, yeah. <laughs> I was born in Augusta, Georgia, but lived there a very brief period of time. Okay. Then my father was a little too old for the for World War II, so he was moved around to various cities, uh, actually smaller towns in Georgia, to run uh, the Georgia Power Company when people who were drafted, uh, he took their place. And then we moved back to his hometown and actually the Copeland hometown of McDonough, Georgia. Our family settled the town. so. Uh, and yes, Sherman burned down the house and all that stuff. But that, you can edit that out. But, <laughs> but <laughs> path right through the family it. home. Family yeah. home. Yeah, really? uh, there are two of them, and one still stands. But uh, so uh, we moved back to McDonald. My dad went into business with a cousin in Griffin, Georgia, and then opened. They opened a business in Atlanta. He was a plumbing, heating, and electrical contractor, which I knew I did not want to do. <laughs> and now, how having said that. In the Copeland family, I would say easily 25% of us are docs of one sort or another. Oh, that is family before you or family that after family you or both? Family before and actually the family after, no. The family before, yes. I have four first cousins who are, who were, actually they're dead now, unfortunately, who were, mm -hmm. uh, went to medical school and did various things. And I have an uncle who uh, was, an, uh, was a mentor, and he had no. He and his wife, my aunt Jean uh, Murray Copeland, had no children, so they were kind of like a second family. But and the bottom line is, the only thing I was good at was basically was science stuff. Oh. I made A's in that, and I made B's and C's and everything else. So I really had no choice. <laughs> so <laughs> <That's> simple. <laughs> so my upbringing, I mean, my mother taught school, all of those kinds of things, and I was a fairly good athlete, etc. Uh -huh. but, uh, but the bottom line is, I went to Duke University, and for me to make decent grades to get in medical school, I had to take chemistry and biology and those kinds of things because philosophy and economics was not my forte. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Um, how did you go into, well, so you decided to go to medical school then? Yeah, it was a foregone conclusion. I, you know, I wouldn't have been able to make a living if I had not become a doctor or Okay, <laughs> okay. So, I'm obviously being facetious, but it was a—it's just sort of a natural. But it's path. what you were happy. Yeah. Well, I, well, so was, in terms of how good I am, which may be way down here, that was where I was best. Okay. And why, from there, did you go into surgery? From medicine, why, why did you? Well, I think surgery? that most of us in academic medicine follow our basic science interests, quite frankly. And, uh, and my basic science interest, and the one I was best in, was anatomy. I think three-dimensionally. I think most good surgeons do what you don't know other people don't. So it's easy for me today to tell you the anatomy of the hand because I can actually see it. Mm -hmm. Don't test me. Right? So, so I, took a, uh, I took an elective. At, I went to Cornell Medical School in New York City, and I took an elective uh, in the dog lab, but we're doing a project that required operating on animals to see if I had any technical skills. I'm left-handed, and uh, very left-handed, and so I had to be sure I could actually use the tools for right-handed people with my left hand. The answer was yes, and I enjoyed it, and I was good at it. And so from that moment forward, I knew where I wanted, needed to be. Surgery is a, this may sound strange, but surgery is a hobby. There aren't very many professions where you can actually get paid for a hobby. Now, you help people, you get paid for it, and all that kind of thing. Teaching medical students, all that's a hobby. So for us who have grown up as surgeons and grown up in the university atmosphere, we're one of the lucky few who actually get paid for something we pay them to do. You're the second <laughs> person to say that this morning. Well, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's interesting. Um, so according to your resume, uh, you went to Vietnam when you finished your residency, is that I did. Right? Yeah. And that's because you're in the Berry Plant. Berry Plant, a man named Berry, obviously, <laughs> uh, 
set up a program. Do you know about the Berry Project? I do. Yeah. I do. So, so I, you know, I was signed up for two years when I, when I got done. I was offered the opportunity to go to the Walter Reed Research Institute and offered the opportunity to go to Europe and offered the opportunity to go to the Burn Unit. But I'm, but I'm left-handed. So I didn't want to spend a couple of years out of, out of the surgical discipline. I quite, quite frankly was afraid I might lose my skills. So it makes that much of a difference? No, if you're but I thought it did. Oh. Yeah, I didn't know whether it did or not. But I, so I said, well, this, I'll just, you know, go. So I went. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> and here I sit. I survived. Good. Mm. So how did that experience affect you um, uh, professionally and personally? <laughs> Well, I don't think it affected me personally at all. Professionally, it was it was a great experience. University of Pennsylvania did no trauma. I think I once saw a nurse who cut her wrist. I'm I'm very serious about that. Yeah. So uh, so I had to learn how to do trauma surgery. Now, wartime trauma is a bit different than than trauma in a stateside area. But I was stationed in Saigon. And there was something like 200,000 people that we took care of, either employees of the federal government or the Vietnamese that worked for us, or the military. So we had a, a lot of civilian trauma. So I became fairly accomplished as a trauma surgeon and have taken trauma calls and all those kinds of things throughout my career in various times, although I'm a cancer surgeon, if you will. So, so that without any question, that was, a, that was a great boon to my own personal development. It also gave you a, a, a look-see into the rest of the world and to what you, to maybe this country should and should not be doing. Uh, I think if we had had more people who've made decisions lately go to Vietnam, they wouldn't have made the decisions they made, to tell you the truth. So, uh, so I, you know, I can observe that, be frustrated by it. I can't do anything about it. But it was certainly broadening from that point of view. And it was interesting for me to realize that why this country is so great is because of, of the immigration of other people here. You know, there's 18,000 Ethiopians living right here in Washington, D.C., the majority of whom are citizens. Hmm. So this country is great because of people who immigrated. Your folks immigrated. Right. So did mine. <laughs> they just don't look like us now. You know, so, uh, so this country has always been it's built on immigration. You've got to keep people out you don't want, but immigration is the heart of, the, of America. And hmm. It was not more than two or three years that medical students from Vietnam began to show up in medical school. Very simple reason. The top 5% of their population, this is just my opinion, the top 5% mm -hmm. of their population came here. And, and all, why do you think that was? Because they had opportunities here. First of all, they had the get up and go, if you will, to come. They had the resources, although many came on boats. And, and they realized that their kids and themselves had a better opportunity in this country. Same reason everybody else came. Right. Yeah. And so sure enough, we, we skim the top 5% of that population and look around you now, you know. Uh, two of my, I, mean, I, I had residents, I retired, who were from Vietnam, and, and you, don't pay, you know, I pay attention because I know their names, I know their Vietnamese names. So, right. so it gave me the opportunity to talk to the Ethiopian cab driver who brought me over here. He lived here 30 years. Huh. And as, as I say, there's 15,000 Ethiopians in this very town, the majority of whom are citizens. You know, mm -hmm. so, so this country is the same as it always was. Mm -hmm. you know, it's based on immigration here from what happens to be the get up and go people from mm -hmm. other parts of the world. It's true. <laughs> um, going back to Vietnam, I saw also that you won a bronze star. And I, I did. Now, a lot of us did. I can't, bra I can't brag about being the only one. Bronze stars are, are based on two, two types. There's bronze star with a V for valor, which means you got shot at. And, and then the bronze stars for doing a good job. Oh, okay. And uh, the thing that was in, that, that I interest, that I, that they showed interest in me more than maybe other people is I went down to the Australian First Field Hospital frequently to help the Australian surgeons do surgery because they would rotate every six weeks. So that was a little bit unique for me. You know, there's some other things that, that I, I could tell you, but, you know, they're not germane to this, <laughs> this, uh, this interview. Okay. Well, they actually are, that's... but I don't, want, I don't want to tell you about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, then tell us. <laughs> well, no, we t the, the, his the situation with going t down to Vung Tau was a province that we, uh, we took care of, uh, of uh, 
100% burn patients from there for a while, and then we're burned over 100% of their yeah, body. Yeah, they were going to die, and they did die. 100% is lethal now, lethal then, and uh, so we knew they were going to die. Uh, they didn't, and we didn't tell them, but they died, and and so they invited me. Uh, Dave Munson is the person. He just retired, I think, in uh, in Chicago. But Dave Munson and I were invited down there, and uh, actually, I'm not sure if Dave went. Now, that I come to think about it, but anyway, I was invited down there. As, sort of pay us back for taking care of these two people as best we could. And uh, and we got up in a firefight and, up, you know, all those kinds of things and shot at and missed, for, fortunately. Uh, and uh, that was interesting. So that was also somewhat part of the part of the deal. Huh, interesting. And the way I got involved in going down to, to uh, their hospital to help out with their surgeons, surgeons who were changing every six weeks. I went down for a week and and work with them. Hmm, I see. Okay. They were all older than me. It was kind of interesting. <laughs> I was yeah. a young guy helping them, which is a new experience. So you had something to learn from them, perhaps. And they had, yeah, exactly. Oh, sure. Yeah. And they had a lot yeah. to learn from me. And I have yeah. some. Most, I have some Australian friends. They're still alive and working, and I haven't oh. seen them in a long time. But I, they're still there. We, we keep in touch. So after your military service, then you came back here and you did a fellowship at MD Anderson. I did. And what led you to specialize in surgical oncology? Uh, a lot of reasons. First of all, I have an interest in the disease, but I have even more of an interest in the people who have the disease. Hmm. If you want to cure somebody, that's the specialty you go into because virtually everybody you operate on who has a malignancy, you're operating for a cure. Not always. Sometimes you're operating for palliation, you know, they're obstructed or something, but you're operating for cure. Secondly, you operate all over the human body. And remember, I told you that my interest in anatomy and being good at it mm -hmm. uh, also led me to being able to operate on the foot or the leg or parts of the body that you don't go into very often because, uh, you know, I could review it and do it. Also, the surgery was big, and I enjoyed, I enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are the primary reasons. Plus, quite frankly, I'd always planned to do that. My uncle Murray Copeland was a surgical oncologist, so all those reasons. Ah. Good. Tell us about your uncle. Um, he was your earliest mentor, perhaps? Uh, he was the per well, my mother and father were my earliest mentors. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, but Uncle Murray was certainly around, and he was, he was president of the American Cancer Society and you know, made a, a pretty much a good name for himself. And, and, uh, and uh, he was a surgical oncologist. He did head and neck and all that. So he even did radiation therapy and medical oncology when he came along because uh, this is in, he graduated from. Johns Hopkins, I think, in 1927 or something of that sort. So maybe a little bit later. I, don't, I, I know it, but I don't have it firmly in my mind. But uh, when he was at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Institute, he and a man named Gashikta actually started doing radiation therapy in the basement of that institution. And then Gashikta was a pathologist and was at Georgetown when my uncle, who spent four years in the military, uh, working with a man named I.S. Rabdin, as a matter of fact, who's at the University of Pennsylvania, which is why I went there. But, but uh, 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 so uh, he was he was the real deal, and and I I could appreciate that, and so I wanted to emulate him, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> so what what qualities of his did you admire most? He was well organized. I mean, we can, hopefully we can all operate. I mean, I've been trained in residence for a long time, and some are better than others. They're all as good, one as good as the other when they finish because you train them differently. But, but uh, so operating is hopefully they can all do that. And my residents have all proved that they can. <laughs> so I can say that without fear of being contradicted because they're out there, and I'm not going to train anybody else. But he also was well organized. He was interested in, the, in cancer as a disease. Uh, he and Gashikta, as a matter of fact, classified bone tumors. They've never been classified before, and so he gets credit for having done that, you know, sarcomas of the bone and those kinds of things. Uh, so he, he was interested in the, in the uh, was at Georgetown for a long time. He was interested in the academic side, and people looked up to him, and, and uh, because LaSalle LaFall is an example. Mm -hmm. You know, LaSalle LaFall, we talked about my Uncle Murray today. So, uh, so uh, uh, I didn't 
I didn't do it for that reason, but it appeared to me that, it, that people liked him and he liked what he did and his patients liked him and I was good at what he did, so it seems so obvious to me. Okay, all <laughs> right. right. Um, in your presidential speech on the role of mentoring in creating a surgical way of life, you mentioned the 80-hour week, which apparently came in um, not I too long before you assumed the presidency. It did. And you com as compared with the old system that allowed many more work hours. So you trained under the old system, but you're training other, you were training others under the new system. Um, how do you feel about the advantages and disadvantages of, um, of both of those? Surgery is a hobby. If someone told me I could only make model airplanes for 80 hours and I was used to making them for 120, I'd tell them to go stick their head in the sand. It's just that simple. We have, we have I, I in fact stepped down as chair uh, before the 80 hour work week took its place, not because of, just by happenstance. So, so I, I have trained residents under the 80 hour system. I've trained residents under the other. I've never trained residents under the 80 hour system as chairman, but I certainly have trained them under it. And, uh, and in fact, uh, I don't think Connie Lee would mind my mentioning her name. She's going to take a pediatric surgery residency. Connie Lee clearly enjoyed surgery, enjoyed the patients, enjoyed every aspect of it. So she, let me put it this way, she may have occasionally violated the 80-hour rule. <laughs> and, and our faculty, which is most of them are still my faculty, say, gosh, she's just working too hard. She didn't have any social life. I said, leave Connie Lee alone. And Connie Lee enjoys what she's doing. Leave her alone. She likes to operate on people and take care of them. You know, it's ridiculous. So I'm very proud of Connie Lee. And, and, and so the, that the issue there is, is uh, I don't see the communication and the absolute compassion that you see in the 80-hour work week people as I saw in the people who were on call as much as the surgeon that was at George wished them to be. That may not be accurate across the board, but that's the thing that bothered me, and I have seen that to some degree. And it's morphed into uh, surgeons becoming employees. I don't think employees have the same interest in their patient uh, across the whole spectrum of their disease, i.e., start, operative, post operative, follow up. Do you think it's because of, of the division between work and home, or do you think it's because of advances in technology that have changed the relationships between surgeons and their Well, patients? I guess the XY generation, I mean, you read about that all the time, you know, the, the so-called X generation of people, the ones that follow along after uh, the, the, the group that was, you know, baby boomers, if you will. Uh, and and the, their style is to is to 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 like a lifestyle. Now, quite frankly, my lifestyle was practicing surgery. I married my wife because she thought that was wonderful, and uh, you know we've raised two kids. She raised them, <laughs> and they did well. Uh, and and we, all, we we've both we've been married fifty years. We've both done well. So so she, I don't think tolerance is a, is the issue for her. I mean, I think that she obviously tolerated. I don't think she noticed it because she anticipated that when uh, when we got married. And I think most of the people who you're interviewing here, their wives would probably tell you that they'd probably tell you the same thing about their wives. So our, well, my uncle, my uncle uh, quoted Osler. Osler was, uh, you know, who Osler was. Yes. People listen to this will. Oslo said that, uh, that medicine's a jealous mistress. No more accurate statements have been made. And we're getting away from medicine being a jealous mistress. Is that good or bad? I don't know. Time will tell. Uh, but uh, I don't particularly want somebody taking care of me eight hours and turning my care over to somebody else the next eight hours and turning my care over again to somebody the next eight hours. I just assume the same person do it continually. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that will be a potential problem with the system. I wrote an article called The Perfect Storm 
in a perfect storm is uh, we have students in the X Y generation who enjoy a, a lot a, a better lot better lifestyle <laughs> than we ostensibly did as surgeons. And they're wrong about that from my point of view. But they but that, that's what they wish to do. They wish to spend more time at home with their families. They're I don't want to say more involved. Nobody was more involved than me, but uh, with my family. But that's the way things are. And uh, about a year ago, I asked the third year medical students uh, how many of them plan to work for some type of health system as an employee. Every one of them raised their hand. Hmm. Now, I think that's not a good thing, frankly. Mm -hmm. I'm probably not in the minority in that regard, but I think that's not a good thing. Uh, I want to be a now. I'll tell you what proved to me that it's uh, that it's okay to see different people. I never thought that a woman would go to see her obstetrician for all of her pre-delivery stuff and then accept another person delivering her. I was totally wrong, and, and you all you know that because you probably lived that. So it's obvious that some people, probably most people, don't really care for to have different people moving in and out of their medical, a particular disease process medical care. Uh, I but, don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I... Well, my, my, you've, yeah. I made my point. So, so that's, that's my pro My wife just, not with me because she's ill, she broke her hip and, and she needed a blood transfusion. I mean, I knew that. She knew, she'd get up and get dizzy, and, but she couldn't have a blood transfusion because she did not have a hemoglobin below eight. And the protocol call for hemoglobin has got to be below eight. So I said, this is in a different hospital than the one I work in. One I work in, she'd have gotten a blood transfusion. But, but uh, I said, uh, if she stands up and gets dizzy and falls down, does that meet your protocol? She stood up, got dizzy, and fell down with me holding her up. And sure enough, she, she was able to get two units of blood. I think that's, I mean, 90, I'm sure protocols are great for 95% of the population, but who's going to figure out who the 5% are that don't meet the protocol? Yes, you've made your point, I think. I think I have. <laughs> and when somebody listens to this in 100 years, they, if they do, because then, then everything will be on a different kind of disc. You know, they, the stuff that we're doing will be t trash because they didn't save it and all that kind of thing. So, right. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, hopefully not. Hopefully. But uh, you know, it's the way the, it's the, way the world is. <laughs> Copeland, who the hell was he? <laughs> Don't say that to an archivist. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you think mentoring uh, in, in your Presidential speech, you, you mentioned mentoring as being important to res residents under the new system. Um, how can you help? Well, you don't have as much contact with them. You know, you, your contact time is making rounds and operating in the middle of the night and being, having the residents be available to you and you're available to the residents whenever, they're, whenever you're together to, at a time. And if, you're, if, you're, if they're not there because they've got to punch a clock, uh, then they're not getting as much mentoring from the person who they select to admire and and model their life after. Th so that's, as I walk through the audience here, I have people tell me things. I have no earthly, and this is, I have no ego. Well, I do, I'm a surgeon, but, but uh, I have people tell me, you know, that are 50 years old, you can't imagine how much you meant to me. And, Point X. I had one of our, our current faculty members at Florida who's a quite good surgeon, and I, I, we were at a dinner last night. And uh, he said to me, you don't remember this, Dr. Copeland, but you put your arm around me when I was a third-year medical student, and you said to me, you should be a surgeon. He's a surgeon. So, and he claims that not me, he's talking to me. I may be, he may have told 50 other people the same thing. <laughs> but, you know, it just strikes a, a, a note that maybe you have... Right. have but that isn't going to happen if they aren't there, right? Yeah. And that's Hawk. Remember, that particular address is given to the, it's a convocation address to individuals who've been out at least one, two, or three years who fulfill the requirements for joining the college. That's who's sitting out there. 
and they're going to get junior partners who, had, who were not trained in the same environment in which they were trained. And they, don't, they need to know that. They also need to know that they may not be as technically or judgmentally versed in all the disease processes that they learned when they were coming through. So they've got to accept that and they've got to be, the, 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 the pro, what I've said was a mentoring process has got to continue and you people sitting out in the audience have got to recognize that you now will become mentors for the young people who come in after you. Right. That's true. <laughs> That's happened. That is, that is true. Um, you also mentioned mentors who are equal to you in status, um, you can, that you're learning from your colleagues. Well, sure. Um, how, have, how have contemporaries been helpful to you? Uh, oh, well, goodness gracious. I, I mean, first of all, they know more about certain things than I do. And secondly, they, of the things that I think I know, they are, they are constructive or constructively critical. Uh -huh. Or they say, you know, that's, you're right, that's, that's good. I mean, radiation therapy for rectal cancer is an example. You can radiate rectal cancers and they go away in some instances. So you can just locally excise them. We've been doing that since 1976. One of the beauties of our profession, particularly in the academic profession, and to some degree in the private practice arena, is, uh, is you, you talk to them about your successes and you talk to them about your failures. And, and you can talk to them about your failures without fear of punishment and without fear of, of criticism because they know that you are as good a surgeon as they are. So I can say, how do you handle this situation? You know, I, let me tell you what I've gotten. What I, do you feel like you can get your residents out of trouble as well as you could in the past? And they'll say, I just don't let them get into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> which is my philosophy. And <laughs> John Cameron and I share that philosophy. <laughs> you know, let them get in trouble. You haven't got to worry about how to get them out of trouble. You know, the, this is not, this profession is not rocket science. The human body does not change from specimen to specimen. Once you know where the appendix is, it's pretty much there and everybody, same place. <laughs> it moves around a little bit, not much. It's easier than being a Volkswagen mechanic. Is that right? Sure. Because the Volkswagen, Volkswagen moved, look at the Volkswagens today. If you learn to be a Volkswagen mechanic on a little tiny bug with, a, with, a, with the, uh, the engine in the back, you're out of date because they move the engine all over the place. I obviously use this for students, yeah, but, right. but uh, once you learn where things are in the human body, they pretty much stay there. So that's pretty simple. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um. Oh, you also mentioned in your presidential speech that the increasing special about the increasing specialization and gradual disappearance of the broad-based surgeon. Um, why the trend, and why is that trend problematic? Well, it's problematic because there's not going to be any broad-based surgeons. You I mean, know, you think this is really a problem? Oh, you bet. Really? Oh, sure. Oh sure. The, the 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 trend the trend today is for residents to take a get a fellowship in something somewhere. They all do. You seldom see one go into private practice. Now we just I did we had two last year that actually went into private practice. I was I was with a group, not with a, a health in health thing. So I was quite proud of them. But uh, the people that I train can pretty much operate wherever you need to be operated on. You know they do thyroids and parathyroids and. And uh, they don't do neck dissections. I did, but they don't. But they can take the esophagus out. They can work all over the abdomen. They can take out a uterus. That isn't rocket science either, although the GY people do it. And, and we have some that do peripheral vascular. One of my residents or, or, when Texas Tech was just getting started did the peripheral vascular for Texas Tech, Mark Pessum. You know, it was a long time ago, but he never took a vascular fellowship. We just had enough vascular work that the guys who left could do it if they were called on to do it. That's the broad-based surgeon. In today's world, everybody becomes a... <laughs> do you think it takes seven years to learn how to do a, become a breast surgeon? And that's how long it takes? I mean, is that what I mean, the training is? Yeah. I proved you could do it in three months with Connie Lee. <laughs> No, it doesn't. You don't need to go through a full five or six year or even seven year in some places surgical residency 
to learn how to do breast surgery. Now, the judgmental aspect of what to do and when to do it is another thing, but the technical aspect of it is uh, not difficult if you pay attention and you're willing to do a little bit more work to get a good cosmetic result and not get paid anymore for it. But I won't, that's a good thing about being a hospital employee. You don't have to worry about the fiscal implications of what you're doing, but that's a topic for another day. But so people now are, are, are doing laparoscopic surgeons. They'll eventually cut the common duct. What if they've never seen the common duct except on a video screen? Who's going to fix the common duct? The answer is the trauma surgeons. Even in oncology, people have paired themselves off and only doing liver, only doing pancreas, only doing breast, only doing whatever. But yes, if you want to, if you want to be a, a, a breast surgeon and get a certificate from the Society of Surgical Oncology through the American Board of Surgery today, you have to take a breast fellowship, which means you have five years at least of general surgery first. It doesn't take that long. But then you do have your general surgery training, though. Well, yeah, but you don't ever practice it. Oh, okay. Oh, you might. You know, some do. I, the, uh, the, the woman who's on our faculty, Anna Shaw, she'll do whatever shows up, but she is a breast surgeon, if you will. Steve Grobmeyer, who was my partner before her, Steve can do anything he wants to, but uh, you, the, the, the world tends to categorize you. And so Steve gradually became categorized as a breast surgeon, and now he's chief of the breast surgery service at Cleveland Clinic. But I can assure you that he could do anything was required of you in the general surgery realm today. Is that going to be true in the future with the 80-hour work week? And, people knowing that they're going to become a this, that, or the other. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I began not to see people showing up to do breast surgery because they knew they were going to be a trauma surgeon or a laparoscopic surgeon. That didn't bother me. I'd do it myself. <laughs> so, but that's, okay. what you, that's what you see. So therein lies the problem. So the broad-based surgeon of today, of today, not tomorrow, today, is a trauma surgeon. Now, you don't want him to do your mastectomy because that's not trauma. You will seek out someone who is a breast surgeon. And that person will probably be a woman, which is fine. And uh, she, let's stick to she, will have gone through all this training to take two years of training to become a breast surgeon. It so, just doesn't take that long, from my opinion. Right, right. And I've and written this, it probably in that article you we were quoting. Is, it, is this because of subspecialties um, being paid better? Is this because lifestyle, the trend toward... lifestyle, oh, lifestyle, lifestyle, okay. lifestyle. Okay. Breast surgery is not easy. Uh, it's a whole lot harder than people think because of the different things you want to do and maintain cosmesis and cure the patient, all that stuff. But it doesn't take seven years to learn it. But uh, it's nice if you're going to be, uh, if you're a surgeon and you're going to have two or three kids and you, uh, you know, you're in the, we're in the lifestyle generation. That's just a fact. It's written in multiple, multiple places. So uh, laparoscopic surgery, that's scheduled surgery. You do your surgery it's a, and not acute, and, uh, and you go home. Acute care medicine and trauma surgery is where the action is in terms of doing a lot of things around the body. And, they are the, and now we have acute care trauma surgery uh, trainees in acute care trauma surgery programs, and we have about six acute care trauma surgeons at the University of Florida. When I was chairman, we we're all acute care people. We just put that into the mix of whatever else we were doing. And I think if you were to look at our quality, you know, which is the big thing now, which is good, I think if you looked at our quality back there, it'd be about as equal to the quality now. I would certainly hope so. Mm -hmm. Certainly my own was personally. But that's the answer. Yeah. You know, it ties into all the other things you've been asking me. Yeah, yeah. Now, is there anything wrong with that? And, and well, I, it's just not the way. It's, I don't have an answer to that. The answer to that will come in the future. I think it is, but I don't know that. And I've been wrong before on this. I thought with well, the institution of Medicare requiring the surgeon to be in the room for virtually everything was going to affect the training of surgeons. I was trained where the chief resident was by myself. Well, I had residents with me. I had an attending who'd do whatever I wished, who told me, you don't really need me, you're qualified to do that. And I would do it. 
And then I, when I joined the faculty at the, at the MD Anderson and the University of Texas Medical School at Houston, new rules. You had to be there with them all the time. And I wondered whether we could train surgeons adequately in that environment. The answer was we did. Mm -hmm. So that's who's out there now. So I don't know. You know, this may all work fine. I, I just, I just, uh, I would be a trauma. I'd be a trauma surgeon if I had to go to into an oncologic residency and choose an organ <laughs> and eliminate all the other organs. I'd be a trauma surgeon. When I was at MD Anderson, we did we we switched every six months because it's a referral institution. You know, you want to seek out the court of last resort. So, so you eventually build up a practice where people want you to do it, uh, but. For people who were referred in because Anderson was Anderson and everybody was wonderful, you know, <laughs> which actually was true, <laughs> probably still is. We did GI for six months and we switched to soft tissue the other six months. We got tired of doing colon, liver, or stomach, and we switched to doing breast and thyroid and sarcoma. We got tired of it. If I had to do one thing all my career, I would be a trauma surgeon. Uh huh. That simple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I understand. That's just my own. My, my makeup. Right, right. Very different from the current makeup. Yeah. But that's what you're asking me about. Yeah. Um, what did you want to accomplish as president of the college? Well, the, being president of the college is a continuum. Uh, the, the Board of Regents and the Executive Director do the accomplishing. The Executive Director does the accomplishing under, under the supervision's the wrong word, under the under the, with the members of the Board of Regents. And, uh, and so in, in my tenure as a regent and then chair of the Board of Regents and then the, the, the vice president and the president, you're talking about what, eight years, mm -hmm. yeah, eight years of time. So a lot of things happen then. Uh, we've already talked about a lot of them, the eight hour work week, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the, with the, the, the thing that I noticed was we had somewhat of an issue with the members who'd been trained. These people pay their bills. I got paid nothing. By the way, if you're president of the AMA, when I was president of the college, the AMA president, whom I knew, made $600,000. Really? Yes. They probably make more that. than that. Yes, I know you don't. I didn't either. I quit paying my AMA dues. I used to be the archivist at the AMA. Well, the, the guys you yeah. and everybody walks around the AMA with a little tag saying vote for so and so. That's real, because so and so gets paid. Now the reason they say that is they've got to give up their practice, which in some degree is true, and we don't. No, they make six hundred thousand dollars, and I'm proud that they do. Yank Coble, very dear friend of mine, was president of the AMA. I, I think I, Yank. If anybody was worth six hundred thousand dollars, was Yank Coble. <laughs> Well, that's good. Yeah. So, but no, that it says it's, it's a very. I've forgotten how I got off on this, but it's a very different situation because you're paid in one sense, you're not in the other. So the changes, the changes that took place were we had people that were trained in the old system, and we had a new system evolving, the quality care system. Thank goodness for the quality care system, because you want to know the quality of the person operating on you in the current day. In the old day, you could make assumptions that the quality of that person, because he trained at the University of Pennsylvania, or in Galveston, or the MD Anderson, that his, his or her quality was superb. Today, if you've got someone who does laparoscopic surgery, who cuts the common bile duct and opens up your abdomen and who tries to fix the common bile duct, you want to know that that person's qualified. So the measurement of quality is, a, is very, very necessary, and the American college today is big into quality as it should be and measurement standards for quality. But over the transition, you had people that sort of, I won't say thumb their nose at quality, but they were quality people. And so you had them as the primary number of people in the college and you had some of the college hierarchy realizing what was coming to pass. And so the ability to appease the members of the college who are basically paying the salaries of the staff and also get the college in position to move forward with the new system was a little difficult. Uh, and and it, you know, it all, it's all happened, and Dave Hort's fantastic. Tom Russell was, too. I mean, Tom Russell, a dear friend of mine, I, I hope. 
but uh, but Tom recognized Tom was ahead of the curve. Tom knew what was going to happen before it happened, and mm -hmm. and and it was hard to communicate with seventy two thousand people while you're doing something. Yeah, you know. So uh, so he was trapped in a transition year. Hoyt, uh, but he was he was executive director for ten years. You know. So I, the president helps with the president the helps with that. The president helps with that kind of stuff. The president does the. Uh, Ceremonial stuff. Right. The chairman of the board of regents is where the action is. That's yes. where the action is. You know, I traveled to Australia and all these places that invites you to come because you're president of the college. The guy that's got his hand on the pulse is the chair of the board of regents because you know you meet frequent, frequently, etc. Mm -hmm. And that that person eventually becomes, usually, has changed a little, becomes the. Uh, the president of the college. I don't want to say as a payback, but you know, as, as you know, you've earned the right to be considered as the president of the college. Yeah. That's why I say, what have I accomplished? I accomplished anything. But during my tenure, we made this transition, which David Hoyt is wonderful at. During my tenure, we built the F Street property, uh, which is you know right around the corner here, someplace where the communication with people who are interested in Congress. And getting them interested now occurs. David Hoyt just gave the report to us at the past president's luncheon, and uh, and it's amazing what he's been able to accomplish. Now, it's quality, 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 and that's what the federal government is saying: quality, quality, quality. And the federal government is right to say quality, 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 because the training programs are so different, in my opinion, than they were in the past. Now, I can tell you who's good. You know. I can tell you it's good now because I know them, <laughs> I've trained them, but it's getting tougher. So quality measures are very, very important, and attaching payment to quality is also a good thing. So all the things that I never needed, I used to tell our faculty members who would say, God, I don't want Big Brother looking over me, I'd say, Steve Vogel, you know, immaterial, but somebody may remember Steve, listen to this, Steve, I don't want Big Brother watching me, I'd say, Steve, yes, you do because you're the best pancreatic surgeon in the United States. And so as they start measuring your quality and your outcomes against the rest of the country, you're going to stick out like a bright star. So quality is a good thing for those who have good quality. But what an issue there, because you know you had it. It's just never thought much about. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's appropriate to do it now. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about um, the Affordable Care Act? And I, I mean, we haven't Seen well, it we don't know yet. yet uh, I'd put it in place, see what happens. I mean, it's that simple. I don't see what all the big deal is. Put it in place, it works fine. If it doesn't work, change it. <laughs> That's the beauty of a democracy. You know, HMOs. Everybody wanted HMOs. You knew they weren't going to work. HMO, you're paying a doctor to take care of a certain population of people, and he gets whatever's left over. So he provides no care, he gets a lot of money. He provides a lot of care, he ain't getting any money. So that isn't going to work in, in here, ever, anywhere. So you know of any HMOs out there now? Yeah, Medicare has an HMO. But all the HMOs that, they had a pretty good one here in Washington, by the way, that, uh, that uh, there's uh, some good ones, but HMOs disappeared. Oh. You know, they're gone because, because it didn't work, it wasn't going to work, and we vote. So if, if this health care doesn't work, it'll show itself quickly, and we vote. You know, we'll vote for people who want to do something else. But by and large, I... I, am, I have always been an advocate of universal health care, always. We live in a country where every single person should have access to, to care. And we do. They, everybody gets care, but everybody does not get preventative care. And everybody does not feel like they can go to the doctor when, they're, when their upper abdomen begins to hurt them. They wait and go, and their gallbladder is virtually ruptured. And, uh, and so hopefully we'll have enough doctors to take care of all these people, and we will because of the Caribbean medical schools, interestingly enough. We predicted 20,000 short physicians in 2020. Where are those guys going to come from? They're going to come from Americans training abroad. As we sit here today, 80% of the individuals in Caribbean medical schools don't have to worry about a visa. They belong, they're already citizens of this country. And they want to be doctors, or they wouldn't be down there. It's costing them $200,000 a year. Most of them are 28 to 30. So their quality is going to be fine. The human body that they study in the Caribbean, no different than the one they study and come into in Galveston. Now they're going to primarily, they're going to be primary physicians, 
But uh, there are those of us, including me, who say, huh, Karen, being in medical school, huh, it's this guy down there taking advantage. That, that's not true. It's a wonderful source of physicians for us. DO, uh, D, uh, doctors of osteopathy, wonderful source of doctors. North Carolina, uh, where I have a summer home and where we are now, <laughs> well, my wife broke her leg, but uh, they just opened a big a DO school called Campbell uh, Osteopathic Medical School. And a lot of those people who want to go to medical school in this country will not go to the Caribbean. They'll go to that, to that one. It's mm -hmm. going to be large. So, so we're things, medical schools have fallen way behind. Yes, in Florida there were only three. Now there's six. But it takes, if you're going to be a breast surgeon, it takes you 10 years to become one. <laughs> so it takes a while to fill up the pipeline. And the pipeline is going, and so new osteopathic schools is going to take a while. Well, there was, there was that huge growth of medical schools back in the in 70s. In the 70s. And through, I don't see anything the, the, since then. It, there's been nothing since then. Because, because the philosophy was, and whoever looked at the demographics, predicted there would be a huge extra, there would be more doctors than were needed, was the answer. And that has a name and I've forgotten it. But uh, so they stopped. Now the ones that they started came through a, the VA system, and it, pr predominantly through VA, uh, VA affiliations, and those are all doing fine. You know, uh, Texas A&M, uh, University of South Carolina Medical School, to name a few. Norfolk, Virginia, that was not a VA, but it was a, it was a new school. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that thing's been there 40 years, probably, 30 years at least, maybe even 40. Those were the new, those were the new schools in the 70s, and uh, there haven't been any since. Florida's got 17 million people living in it. We, got three, we only had three medical schools. Well, four. We had the University of Florida, University of South Florida, which is relatively new, University of Miami, which is the oldest, and Nova Southeastern, a doc, an osteopathic school, perfectly good school. That's what we had, 17 million people. That doesn't awesome. make any sense. No. Now we've got, a, well, we've, we've got some more, but we've just got those. It'll be a while before they start spitting people out to take care of the public. It's just, it was, it was, it was not a smart thing. Yeah. And people took advantage of that and made a lot of money. People at nursing school. We have, a, we have a, a nursing school to turn out three-year nurses rather than the diploma people who go and don't really, you know. But anyway, we have a school for nurses that's taught to take care of people. They have 60 spots. We get 300 applications for those 60 spots, all Americans. So there's a nursing shortage. It's not because there aren't people that want to go into it. I mean, it, 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 you look, you know, you're looking at Why is that? I can't tell you. I've been writing about it for 20 years. Pay attention to me. <laughs> it's in that thing to some degree. <laughs> Presidential address. Yeah. And now all this is coming to fruition. But fortunately, we have this pool of doctors. You might say, gee, you know, if you're training the Caribbean, you're not as good as somebody who trained at the Massachusetts General. And that's true. But a guy in McDonald, Georgia, who wasn't all that well trained, saved my life a couple of times. He was certainly qualified to do that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay, um, also in your presidential speech, you quoted a letter from Dr. Rhodes uh -huh. of the University of Pennsylvania to you upon your acceptance as a fellow. Actually, acceptance as a board, a board of regents. Board of regents? Yeah. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. Board of regents. Now I became a regent. Oh, okay. I continue to hope that the college will continue to enjoy a reputation as the advocate of the patient rather than the advocate of the surgical member. I'm so, going to make assumption you've been listening to me. <laughs> <laughs> I have. <laughs> but then, then that statement makes a lot of sense. Now, Dr. Rhodes was president of the college. He was president of the American Surgical Association. He was president of the American Cancer Society. He was, my, he was our chairman at the University of Pennsylvania. He was a Quaker, a very nice man. I once heard him say balderdash. That's the worst word I've ever heard him say. And he's dead now, unfortunately. And uh, uh, Dr. Rhodes had a long memory. We didn't think he remembered any of us, but he remembered all of us. And now that I've trained a lot of people, I remember all of them, too. Last night, somebody said, Ted, how do you remember all of this? Mm -hmm. I said, well, I lived it. So I remember, you know, I remember the mole on the side of your face. It's just, it's just there. And uh, I would know Dr. Rhodes said to me uh, when I was going to Florida from MD Anderson, or from the University of Texas, the same thing. 
I said, what do you think, Dr. Rhodes? And he said, uh, it's a little out of the way, which it is, which means you're not going to be a big deal in Europe and travel all over the country, but at 6'5", I didn't really care. I started to care later on, but uh, I belong to all those organizations, but I don't really know those people. And now it would be nice to do that, but, you know, well, I never will. And I was offered several other jobs, and I never left Florida because Florida was a good place to be. It was good for me, and there were 17 million people living there. <laughs> HMOs weren't a problem. <laughs> Patient accrual was not a problem. <laughs> so I was essentially protected. Had no trouble recruiting people. They had to look on the map to see where it was, but once they got there, they never left. Uh -huh. <laughs> Still there. I yeah. suppose so. Still now, the, the, the thing about Dr. Rhodes. So Dr. Rhodes remembered that. He remembered what he'd said, and he also, he also in that same letter, he says, uh, he wrote that letter to say that I had, I had pointed something out to him, the value of going to one place and staying there your entire career. And he congratulated me on having chosen Florida and remembered what he had said. He also, when I asked him whether I should go to either the MD Anson or to the Memorial Sloan Kettering for a cancer fellowship, he didn't answer me. We're on the elevator by ourselves. I'm the repository of all the Dr. Rhodes stories, and this is just one of them. Mm -hmm. He didn't answer me, and uh, this was in the middle of the night, and we went to his office. He said, I'll see you tomorrow, and, and I said, fine. And about two weeks passes by, and we were scrubbing at the scrub sink, and he said, I ask him questions all the time, and he said, Ted, I thought of, I can imitate his voice, but I won't. He said, uh, Ted, I've thought of that question you asked me, and the answer is never. I thought, uh, neither, <laughs> neither. I thought, what in the world is he talking about? <laughs> he meant neither MD Anson or Memorial because we were a cancer place. That's what he did, and we did a lot of cancer surgery. So he had thought of, and I'm sure, a lot and decided I didn't really need to do that because of the training I had. Well, I had to correct him a time or two when he would talk, he would tell people I was MD Anderson trained because he was wrong about that, actually. And so I had to correct him. I was at the Strange University of Pennsylvania, not at the MD Anderson. And so he also one day told me that, that he realized the value of going and taking a, a, one year. Now it's three, way too long. One year, if you go to Penn, one year's plenty. <laughs> But at least it was then. So, uh, mm -hmm. so he remembered those things, and 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 uh, they were incorporated into that letter. That that's about that, because that's about the college. And he realized that that uh, that patient comes first, and all this other stuff is important. But it's it's not patient is A B C D, and that's why the advocacy program the college has today for the patient is a big deal, and people are paying a lot of attention to it. And David Hort, well, they all do get a lot of credit for that. So, so he. So we're the advocate. In fact, we now at the college have an advocacy division. So, so this is what he's talking about, mm -hmm. and he's dead on the number. He was concerned uh, that uh, that we were going to shift our gears. He lived long enough to see the gear shifting starts. So that's what that means. Oh, that's that's what I meant by it. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you.